Welcome, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, we have had a really exciting, invigorating day with lots of um, really generative discussions uh, dealing with the question of the topic of our conference this weekend, which is the globalization of science in the Middle East and North Africa, the 18th to 20th centuries. And so um, it's in that context that I'm extremely pleased, very um, happy to welcome our keynote speaker for the conference today. Um, she is uh, Dr. Carla Nappi, who is, um, has come here from uh, British Columbia, from Canada. So uh, she's, she's made quite a, a track and a schlep. Um, uh, she is Associate Professor of History and Canada Research Chair of Early Modern Studies at the University of British Columbia. Um, her first book, The Monkey in the Ink Pot, Natural History and Its Transformations in Early Modern China, published by Harvard in 2009, was a study of belief making in early modern Chinese natural history through the lens of the Benaco Gang Gangwu, is that correct? There you go, uh, of 1596, a compendium, uh, a compendium of Materia Medica. Um, her current research explores the history of bodies and their translation in early modern Eurasia. She also hosts the New Books in East Asia and New Books in STS podcasts and writes short fiction. And I believe, don't you also have a blog, The Elizabeths? That's one of the short fiction projects. That's one of the short fiction projects. Okay. So, um, so uh, Carla is, is multifaceted, multi-talented. She's a polymath, and she's here with us today. We are so very happy uh, to welcome her um, to speak on Look at the Fish, Decomposing Global Histories of Science. Thank you so much for being here. That totally embarrassing introduction. Thank you everyone for being here. Um, I should say right off the bat, thank you so much to Jane who can't be with us and to Sahar for inviting me to be here. Um, I've been learning so much today. I've been learning about all of the acronyms of Middle Eastern studies, um, so really, um, for me, this is, um, this is really special for all kinds of reasons. Can you hear me back there? Yes. Yeah, usually that's not a problem. Okay, I like to break things, and I like to tell stories. And so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to tell stories about breaking things, and I'm going to tell stories about how to break things in order to tell other stories. And it's all related to this, um, and all of this will be clear, or relatively so, in a moment. Okay, what you see up here, I'm going to be saying a lot more about this. This is a page from a text I'm going to be showing you in a bit um, that's written in Manchu. And I know there's such a big turnout here because I know everyone loves Manchu. You say there's going to be a talk about Manchu on campus and like people flood in. Has anyone in here ever read any Manchu? Know any Manchu? Heard of Manchu? Okay, excellent. All right, so this is going to be super fun. Okay, so I'm going to start by telling you a story. So there's a story about a sunfish. It goes something like this. A very accomplished graduate student, a, a graduate student, um, it should be said, who also has a very um, strong interest in seeming very accomplished. We've all been, or many of us have been that graduate student. Some of us will maybe um, that graduate student. This graduate student goes to Louis Agassiz. Okay? Um, biologist to train with him. Agassiz hands him a little fish and he tells the student, go describe the fish. Go look at the fish, describe the fish. The grad student complains, this isn't fancy enough. It's only a sunfish. He whines. Agassiz says, yes, I'm aware that it's a sunfish. Describe the fish, he tells him, and he sends him away. A few minutes later, the student returns with a very correct and very elaborate textbook description of the fish peppered with Latin words. Agassiz looks at the description. He looks at the grad student. He says, once again, describe the fish. And he sends him away. Student comes back with a four-page essay on the fish species, even more Latin. Very proud of it. Once again, Agassiz says, describe the fish. Look at the fish, he says. And he sends him away. Now, this, just, this goes on for three weeks, according to the story. Each time, Agassiz sends the student away with the same directions. Look at the fish. 
At the end of the three weeks, so the story goes, the fish was very stinky and in a very, very advanced state of decomposition, but the student knew something about it. Okay. Now, there are many versions of the story that have circulated. Um, this was, it happened to be the anecdote with which Ezra Pound opened the book ABC of Reading. Now, as a, um, in my capacity as a teacher at UBC, I've sometimes put a version of this story on the first page of the syllabi for my courses. Pound was using it to emphasize the importance of empirical study of texts. That's not my interest. That's not what I emphasize. I'm interested in it for two different reasons. And these are reasons um, that are really going to be at the heart of my modest contribution to the conference's conversations um, today. First is the importance of something that probably seems really, really simple. So simple, we don't really think much about it, but is actually very, very difficult to do, and very difficult to do in a way that's exciting and creative and sustained, and that is pay attention. Okay? So part of what I'm going to be talking about today is very much about which seems like this very simple act, um, which I want to argue is a practice that can be cultivated, which can make a huge difference in the kinds of stories we tell, paying attention. Second is the importance of the rotting of the fish, the decomposition, the breaking down and coming apart of the fish. Now, things don't stay fixed or stable as we attempt to know them. Okay, there are various versions of this um, statement, uh, this proposition um, that you may have heard, you may agree with, you may not agree with. Things don't stay stable as we attempt to know them. They break down, they rot, they fall apart. Arguably, they were never stable or fixed in the first place. Okay? And we'll get to that, and that's a big part of what I want to ultimately leave you with by the end of the time where you um, are listening to me vocalize at you and hopefully move to us vocalizing together after this. So my talk today is going to use these two actions, paying attention on the one hand and decomposing on the other hand, as the basis for raising some questions. And I'm not going to propose to answer some questions. I'm going to offer some thoughts. But to propose and dwell in some questions about how we might think about what it might look like to write global histories of science as we move forward. I'm going to suggest by the end of the talk that as we move forward as historians of science, or as people interested as in historians of science, or as storytellers of whatever you want to be storytellers of, okay? even though I know afterwards everyone's going to be like, teach me Manchu, it's so cool, I want to learn Manchu too. But you know, even if you're not like that, storytellers of various sorts. Okay, as we move forward, we're going to have to consider moving away from stories about networks and circulation, is what I'm going to propose here. It's not going to be an uncontroversial um, idea. We're going to have to consider moving away from stories about connection and networks and circulation in favor of, I'll argue, stories about decomposition, about e ephemerality, about ruins, about breaking, about coming apart. And I don't just mean, and this is going to be really important today, okay? I don't just mean stories about these things. I mean a practice of telling stories that puts that at the very center of the craft. What would it mean not just to do history where we talk about the importance of things being ruins, but where we're actually creating a practice, creating an archive, telling stories, where that's at the heart of what it is we're actually physically, mentally, and emotionally doing when we put those stories together. That's what today is going to be about, I hope. All right. So these themes of um, global history and its discontents, where we move when we move in the future, are going to be potentially resonant with those of you who spend some time on Facebook and on the internet looking at internet-y things, okay? Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit about this. Um, now, what I'm suggesting is especially true, um, I I'm going to argue, in light of recent reconsiderations of what global histories could be moving forward. I'm going to tell you about what you're seeing in a moment. 
It's also true in light of recent conversations about what some people call the Anthropocene, and some people call the Capitalocene, and some people call the Cthulhu-scene. Every time I try to pronounce this, how do you pronounce it? Cthulhu? 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 Lovecraft fans? No. You will be after this. The word over there in the title, staying with the trouble, making kin in the Cthulhu scene. Okay, it's a Lovecraftian tentacular um, image. You'll understand this completely by the end of my talk. There are a lot of scenes, okay? Um, whatever scene you want to claim that we're in or moving toward, recent conversations about where we are now as people, where we are now on the planet, where we are now um, in terms of understanding global crisis or catastrophe, very much needs to shape our understanding of um, how we use that as a ground from which to move forward and do our work. Basically, where we are right now in global history matters, and it matters to the stories that we're telling. And there's been a lot of conversation about this, at least in the um, circles that I run in and the people that I talk to. Um, so we're going to talk about this. So here's the plan, okay? There's going to be five things. It's going to be awesome. First, I'm going to talk a little bit about my work, um, okay? The nature of my own work in the context of global or world histories of science. Like, why would I have been someone who might have been invited to be here talking about this, right? So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the ground I come from. Then I'll briefly talk about the character of some recent challenges to how we think about the practice and craft of global history. That's going to be super brief, okay? It's just going to be like a whisper and then we're going to move on, but it's important because it's part of why I'm going to be saying the things that I'm saying. Then what I'm going to do is move to a brief consideration of some tools I want to suggest for reorientation toward what might be a different way of practicing global history that might move us away from stories about networks and circulation um, and connected histories, perhaps, um, even insofar as those have been useful to think with. And I'll offer some thoughts on why they might not continue to be useful to think with as much as they have been. I'll then briefly introduce an example of what a history on those principles might be like. Um, what might that look like? And as you see, by how much we're going to get through in like 40 minutes or whatever, I'm not going to take too long on that, but I'm hopefully just going to give you a taste of a practical example that I've been trying to work on of what this could look like. Then I'll offer some brief concluding thoughts. All right, are you with me? Yeah. Yes? yes? Can I hear it? It's the late afternoon. Tell me you're listening. Yes. yes. Good. Let's talk about me. <laughs> Let's talk about me. Yay. I'm going to drink some water. Okay, what do I do? Now, I'm not um, in name a specialist in Middle Eastern anything, even though that's part of what I do. I work on this. Okay, my current work as a historian of science is focused on a period of Chinese history, um, although I'll prob problematize that in a moment, called the Qing. That's how you pronounce that. Okay, Qing. Qing lasted roughly 1644 to 1911, depending on when you want to, like, depending on arguments about when did it actually start? Was it, did it start when it was formally named? Did it end? Long story short, that's roughly the dates that we're talking about. And my period of interest is mostly in the 17th and 18th centuries. If the Qing were a pop artist, it would be known as the artist formerly known as China, okay? The, one of the reasons why I'm interested in this period um, and one of the reasons why a number of my colleagues with whom I am in conversation are interested in this period of Chinese history is that it's arguably not Chinese history at all. Um, in this period, China doubles in size. A whole bunch of different kinds of people come into the empire. This is when Taiwan comes into the empire. This is when Xinjiang comes into the empire. Okay, this is when um, Tibet, arguably, comes into the empire. Notice I'm saying empire a lot. Empire, empire, empire. Um, those of us who are historians who are interested in understanding China as an imperial power, not as a victim of imperial history, but as itself, an important imperial power that has consequences leading up to today tend to be particularly interested in this period. Um, if you're interested in translation, it's fascinating. Um, and many, eh, is that fair? A number of us in various contexts 
have tended to move away from describing what we do when working on this period as working on China. We're working on the Qing Empire. And that's a way of signaling we're talking about Tibetan texts and Mongolian texts and um, Turkish texts and Chinese texts and all kinds of languages and peoples and cultures that are not easily subsumable into a comfortable, simple notion of China or Chinese. So that's kind of where I'm working right now. So I'm looking at science in the 17th and 18th centuries, or what I'm calling history of science in the 17th and 18th centuries, and what I'm looking at when I think I'm doing that are basically efforts to understand and communicate thoughts about bodies and their transformations. Bodies of all sorts, human bodies, non-human bodies, planetary bodies, plants and animals. So that is what I do. Now right now in that context, I'm focusing on the significance of a particular language in this context. This is the Manchu language. Okay, now we're coming to Manchu. And I'm interested in Manchu because Manchu was a medium of translation. It was a language that was used as a tool for translating ideas about bodies among um, Chinese speakers, French Jesuits, people that are typically working on Latin texts, native Manchu speakers, um, Russians, like lots and lots of people in this period, I want to argue, are using this language as a kind of lingua franca for talking about and translating ideas about bodies. And I'm really, really interested in this. Okay? So I've been doing this and I've been looking at this specifically by looking at a range of some different kinds of sources and trying to create a conversation among texts that wouldn't necessarily obviously scream out as being part of the same conversation. Okay? And here are uh, ooh, five, yes, five examples of them, and I'm going to tell you what they are. One set of texts I'm really interested in is dictionaries. Okay, this is a page of many, many hundreds, thousands of pages of um, a Qing era dictionary of five languages. Okay, so it's organized according to topics. Words having to do with people, words having to do with buildings, words having to do with plants and animals, etc. And in each of those topics, for each term, there are five different languages for each term that are given. Okay, so what you're seeing on top, um, each one of these four columns is a, is a term, okay, the equivalent of a term. Up top, you got the Manchu. Then you've got Tibetan, you've got the Manchu rendering of what the Tibetan sounds like. Then you've got Mongolian. Then you've got um, Uyghur, um, a Manchu rendering of what the Uyghur sounds like. And then you got Chinese. Lots of cool stuff going on. Questions you can ask about this if you're interested in bodies and their transformations include, oh, look, there's a whole section of curse words, right? Many of which involve animal and plant names and sort of body part names in them. So if in Manchu, to really curse someone off, I say, you're a maggot. All right, think about this for a minute. Let's, how do you translate that? What are you translating when you translate, like, you know, an impolite gesture, which is basically what this kind of a, verbal, a verbalizing is, right? How do you translate what's basically a, a vocal performance of an impolite gesture telling someone to go somewhere that's not here, very impolitely, in five different languages, right? What does that mean? And how is that part of a language of the natural world and its transformations um, that is happening in Manchu? Um, there's also a whole section of sounds on a, of on a whole section of onomatopoeias, like the sound of teeth cracking on ice, the sound, there's a specific sound, there's a specific word for the sound that the wings of a grasshopper make mm. when it takes flight, like pages and pages of this. So this is the kind of document um, that I'm trying to use to tell this story about Manchu translation and bodies. I'm also interested in poems. I won't say too much about this. This is a page from a manuscript that's of a text that's only held in one manuscript at Harvard Yenjing Library. Okay? Um, and this is a book of translations of Chinese poems by this one translator Manchu poet guy. He is someone I like to consider, this is totally going to date me. Some of you are going to chuckle at this reference and others are not going to know what I'm talking about and I'm going to do it anyway. I'm going to do it anyway. He's the Rodney Dangerfield of translators. Anybody know, anybody recognize that? I don't get no respect, okay? When you think Rodney Dangerfield and you grew up in the Bronx and in New Jersey, as I did, you think, I don't get no respect. 
So this translator is constantly complaining in his poems about how nobody respects translators, he's poor, um, he doesn't have good things to eat, it's because it's like nobody cares about the work of translators and isn't that horrible, um, you know, there's a lot of this uh, kind of motion in this text. But he also talks a lot about plants and animals and bodies and their transformations. So I'm used, looking at these. A text written in Tibetan about Mongolian materia medica that also uses Manchu language stuff. How do you think about a rosary or rosary beads as medicinal drugs? That's what this is. This is one of the texts I'm looking at. Rhymed texts, so poems about drugs and their qualities. Um, here, this is from a Manchu text that's a translation of a poem about drug qualities in Chinese. And this is the equivalent of like if you're in med school and you learn kind of rhymes to memorize like what are the bones, etc. Or you're in grade school and you learn kingdom phylum class order of family genus species. How do you remember that? King Philip chases orangutan for game sport. You know mnemonic devices. Mother very early makes jelly sandwiches using no peanut butter. The planets, right? This is a text that was basically that but for memorizing the qualities of like ginseng and chrysanthemum. And there's a Manchu translation that exists. Um, and so I'm trying to put this into conversation with those two. So this is to, to, just to say, all of these except the one I'm gonna tell you about now, what I'm trying to do is put these into conversation to tell some sort of a story about bodies and their transformations, um, especially in translation in Manchu. Okay, so now we come to him. This is what I'm going to spend most of my time talking about today. Okay? Um, I'm also working with texts and this and one particular text about anatomy, okay? about bodies. This is a page um, from this like 600 some odd page manuscript held in a library in Paris um, that is a, a use of Manchu to translate knowledge about bodies from French and Latin texts into a Manchu context. And you see an image there. Um, this is from a text that describes the architecture of the nose and the inside of the nose. And so you see, this is going to become important. You'll see why. You see the skin is peeled back, right? Um, and there are uh, Manchu uh, letters there that are labeling the parts. And down here, what you're seeing is this is the Manchu description of what all the parts are. Okay. So I've been spending, in other words, a lot of time looking at and thinking about the use of Manchu as a language of translations of bodies and bodily experience in central Eurasia, especially at the Qing court. Now specifically, what I've been trying to do with this anatomy text in particular, and I'll tell you more about it briefly in a bit, is to try to find a way to pay attention differently to it to read it not as a book about a collection of body parts, lungs, spleen, nose, etc., but instead as a book about the way kinds of orientation in time and space. Kinds of orientation in time and space, or what I've taken to call prepositional experience, to-ness, on-ness, between-ness, through-ness, after-ness, etc., create bodily experience and understandings and translations thereof. So this is a project that tries to imagine, can I transform this text by paying attention to it in a different way than is obvious given the field that I work in? And in doing that, in paying attention to it in a different way, can I transform what the text is from an archive of descriptions of parts, right, lung, spleen, to an archive of descriptions of experience of throughness and to-ness and onness and fromness, because that, that kind of experience, I want to argue, is what makes material experience. That's where bodily experience comes from. Okay? Now, I won't say a whole lot more about that now, because I'll come back to that in more detail in a bit, and I'm going to tell you um, my example when I get to that part, after we talk about Cthulhu, etc., I'm going to tell you about skin specifically. I've been looking at skin. But I want to give you a sense of the ground, the grounding from which my work grows. Now, important for the purpose of this conversation over these two days is the fact that I'm interested in how this particular context can speak to 
and can inform how we think about and how we practice something like global history of science. And I'm especially interested in the significance of translation for the history of science in something like a global frame. And you'll hear me hedging about the language of the global a lot, and we'll come back to that as well by the end of my time here. Now, part of what I've been thinking about lately is what makes my work part of an endeavor um, that we might call global history of science, right? What does that mean? What could it mean? And um, why does it matter? Why should we care? What are the stakes here, right? Why spend minutes of our one finite mortal lives talking about this and not doing something else, like reading Kim Stanley Robinson's latest book, if you are a sci-fi fan, um, which I also do. Now, when I started in this business, of course, there were constant questions and debates over what constituted global history versus world history versus connected history. And we've probably, many of us have probably had at least some version of those conversations. But recently, the character of those conversations has started to change. And this brings us to part two, OK? This is the next step along the path of the talk. OK, so a lot of us um, in this room have been telling stories about global history that are about connections and circulations and itinerancy and go-betweens that facilitate exchange. We tell stories about contacts and networks and linkages and networks and flows, or nodes and flows. But we can't ignore the fact that we're living in a very particular and very significant global moment right now. This is the cover of Kim Stanley Robinson's um, new novel. It's a science fiction novel that imagines a New York City that has essentially become a kind of Venice thanks to global warming. And I'll actually come back to this because it's actually, I think, um, pretty good to think with. Recent critiques have called the future of global history into question in the context of our contemporary moment urging that historians need to rethink popular and lauded approaches to networked and connected histories with their contacts and linkages, and suggesting a reorientation toward a history that equally emphasizes, or perhaps more so emphasizes, separation, disintegration, and fragility. And that language is taken from this piece here. Anyone in here actually read this? This has been making the circulation, OK. Um, of um, historians on Facebook. Um, this is a recent piece by Jeremy Edelman, um, who um, is very involved in global histories in Aeon Magazine online. It's really thoughtful, OK? Now, part of the idea here, um, according to Edelman and some others, is that our global histories are importantly getting things wrong. And they're doing that because in the interest of creating a kind of utopian, idyllic, networked series of stories, we've been importantly leaving things, people, places, scales, and phenomena out of the story. Now, part of the problem is a pretense that wholeness and connection, or wholeness and comprehensiveness is possible. Okay? An interest in wholeness and connection and mobility arguably, according to this, has overwritten and erased the messy, unconnected, broken, fragile, decomposing parts of history and has skewed our stories and has skewed them really importantly with really important stakes. Okay? Now, I don't necessarily agree with everything in this piece, um, but that's not the point of a piece like this. right? It's not to generate widespread agreement. Um, it's, as I understand this, it's to be productive food for thought, and I think that it is. OK, so many of us here at this conference are historians of science. And we're here to talk about globalization in the history of science. Now, in light of those challenges I just briefly mentioned to concept and practice of global history, how does this demand, I think, a reorientation for our work as historians? I think it does demand a reorientation, or at least a consideration of that. And I want to turn now to briefly talk a little bit for you, at you, about how we might go about doing that, OK? We are making a rapid progress here. Doesn't it feel rapid? OK. OK, so for me, there are a number of contemporary thinkers who have offered tools to help imagine the global histories that might come next. Even if, um, and often that's not um, at all what's going on here, it's not really the main goal of any, or even an incidental goal of any of the people I'm going to talk about or mention here. But still, they're tools. 
Now, part of this involves thinking about these various terms I mentioned at the beginning, um, the Anthropocene, Capitolocene, Cthulhu-Cene, et cetera. One of these tools is a recent work by Donna Haraway. Uh, this is Staying with the Trouble. Here, she uses this term Cthulhu-Cene, okay, as a name for what she calls a tentacular being that characterizes our present moment. She calls this a name, this is her words, or Donna Haraway, the author's words, a name for the dynamic, ongoing, symchthonic forces and powers of which people are a part, just a part, within which ongoingness is at stake. Maybe, she says, but only maybe, and only with intense commitments and collaborative work and play with other Terrans, Terrans, dwellers of the earth, flourishing for rich multi-species assemblages that include people will be possible. Okay, this is what she says. So you'll have heard some key aspects of this just in what I said. Multi-species, not putting humans at the center. Collaboration, dynamism, play. Play is really, really key here, okay? Now, in this recent collection of essays that takes part of its name from this tentacular term, Donna Haraway is doing a lot of things, and I won't pretend to offer any kind of comprehensive accounting of them. You know I'm not interested in comprehensiveness anyway, but I find a few of her points here especially useful to think with. I'm just gonna briefly show you what they are, right? Part of what she advocates brings me back to where I started this talk. In making work of all sorts when we, as we move forward, and I think for me it's about storytelling, right? Whether you call yourself a historian or, or want to ever do that or not. She suggests that we need to learn to be truly present. Now for me, this is another way of saying we need to learn to pay attention and to pay attention differently. Now paying attention, arguably, is a crucial part of the craft of the historian. It's how we assemble our archives. Archives broadly construed, not just of the building where the documents are, right? Like, this can be an archive, right? Insofar as it's a collection of um, things I can notice, traces that I can compile and look at as a collection to see patterns and tell stories with, okay? So this can be an archive. That's how I use archive when I'm using that term here. So paying attention is a crucial part of the craft of what we're doing as a historian how we assemble our archives, how we decide where and how and when and why to look and to find traces from which we make our stories. We find, we make traces as traces. They do not necessarily pre-exist us, arguably. And I want to emphasize this is a crucial part of what it is we do and what it is we need to think about doing differently moving forward. She also talks about the importance of understanding what we do, our work, our efforts to know the world around us as a process not of composing, but of composting, okay? Um, this brings me back to the decomposing fish. To make things, to make our stories, we need to grow our words and ideas from stuff that's rotting, decomposing, coming apart, um, I think, at least one way forward. And it's gonna be significant in a bit. Now it matters, she says, what ideas we use to think other ideas, what stories we use to tell other stories, that actually matters. And I think this is resonant um, I, with recent concerns about the way we tell our global histories. She also emphasizes the significance of understanding ourselves as grounded in the earth. Everyone lives somewhere, she says. Everything is connected to something, with a kind of reaching outward in a tentacular way. Now for me, this is also really significant in that it speaks to a commitment that I have personally as a historian to constantly, to try to constantly be aware and make the people experiencing my stories aware that I'm speaking and writing from a particular place and time and context, okay? It's really, really important to me um, and it very much um, inf or it infiltrates or infuses everything I do. So there's lots more to think in that text, but we'll leave it there um, for the moment and turn to something that came up over lunch, mushrooms. Now, Anna Singh, who's an anthropologist, is also doing resonant work here, and I'll be increasingly brief as we move through. This book is what she calls a riot of short chapters that collectively point to the formative power with respect to global phenomena and flows, not of networks and systems, 
but of messy and partial entanglements. Okay? It's a book about um, matataki mushrooms. Now, she also talks here about the significance of noticing as a deliberate practice, or paying attention, I would translate that, as a deliberate practice. Really, really important to this is the idea that this is a practice that can be cultivated, okay? We don't just notice. You can, you need to learn and work on and labor constantly to pay attention to notice. It's part of a craft that needs work to develop. She also emphasizes the importance of attending to precarity, the precarious, in our stories as a kind of fragility, but also showing us the forms of resilience and resistance within precarity. Now, one of the last, or the second to last thing I'll mention is Ken Wark's recent book, Molecular Red. Now, his recent book resonates even further with many of these um, cases, in some cases explicitly. He urges us um, that we need to rethink notions of individuality. This is a key term for me individuality, and the forms of existence that go along with neoliberal capitalism in this era of global crisis. Um, now, uh, one of the things that came up in our morning conversations and afternoon conversations um, was a comment that the stories in a particular paper were capitalist stories, right? I mean, I would say maybe all of our stories, um, insofar as they're about the power and circulation of individuals of all sorts, individual people, text ideas, are capitalist stories. And maybe that's a problem. Like, maybe that's something we can think about. Work describes the Anthropocene as a series of metabolic rifts. Labor extracts molecular flows from the world, from rocks, from soil, from plants, from animals, but the flows don't return from where they came. Okay? And this is a crisis that he points to. He says, this is the end of prehistory, going back to our conversations about history and prehistory before. This moment when planetary constraints start really coming to bear on the ever-expanding universe of the commodification of everything. And he reminds us of the significance of also another science studies um, powerhouse, uh, Karen Barad, in whose work she reminds us, and this is also to speak to something that came up earlier today, agency is not something we have. Agency is not something you give to someone. Agency is not something that's missing. Agency um, is something that is produced at a particular moment in particular circumstances through an encounter, okay? Agency is not something humans or non-humans have. It's an effect of a situation. Um, and I think this is also useful to think with in ways that'll come up when we start getting to skin and things soon. But I have to show you sci-fi because I love the book. Hey, okay, finally, this is the last tool I'm gonna propose to think with. Um, this is a science fiction novel that thematizes global warming, um, things falling apart, nothing staying where it's supposed to, everything decomposing, stable networks being replaced by fast-moving series of ephemeral comings together and comings apart and attempts to tell stories by finding patterns in the ephemerality, knowing that the usefulness of those stories is also ephemeral and that the stories are also going to decompose. Okay? All right, so let's take a step back from all of this. In terms of tools helping us reorient to new forms of global history, even though that's not what any of them are trying to do explicitly, right? This is not, not any of the explicit goals of any of these books. What do they re collectively reflect back at us? What we have here is an acknowledgement that how we tell stories matters. What stories we use to tell other stories matters and that those stories moving forward are going to increasingly be about, following the language of Edelman, separation, disintegration, fragility. Now we have a series here of reflections on the importance of paying attention, of learning to make and work in a world of decomposition, ruins, precarity, and of understanding the ephemerality of ourselves and of the material and social worlds around us. And we learn also to think about things, about all sorts of things, maybe about all of the things, as fundamentally fractured and multiple and always in the process of transformation. Stability is a myth. 
Now, I've been thinking a lot about this um, and about what a historical practice that embodies these concerns might look like. Okay, what might it look like, again, not to like talk about this, quotation, citation, this person, whatever. I mean, that's not actually that challenging to do. Um, but what might it look like to actually do this, to actually put this into practice um, as a historian? And I'll spend much of the time that I have left, um, again, briefly talking a bit about where I am in terms of my thinking about this right now. Okay, so back to me, back to me for an example. All right, here we go. I'm interested in detritus. I'm interested in decomposition, traces, residues, fragments, broken things, processes of breaking. Now, in my work, and this is important to me, I do not try to recreate the intentions and actions of historical people. That's not what I do. I'm glad that's what other people do. It's not what I do. I interpret traces to tell stories about, to flesh, the world those people might have made together. I sift through, I try to read the bone shards and use them to say something interesting, to say something helpful, to say something productive. Put another way, I write histories that come from sustained acts of attention to detritus. Okay? And right now, what I'm doing is trying to bring these practices and concerns to bear on questions of materiality in history. Now, I'm trying to write, as I mentioned before, a history of bodies um, as spaces for comings together and movings apart, okay? Ephemeral relationships that produce material experience. And I'm trying to do that in a way that understands all objects, all objects, to be constantly in the process of coming together and coming apart. Or to put another way, I'm trying to not take for granted that there are stable individual historical objects, things, concepts, people, that pre-exist my encounter with traces and detritus in an archive. How do you do a history of this water bottle without it being a history of the water bottle? Okay, Just explain what I mean in a moment. So this is an attempt to move away from comprehensiveness in global, or to move away from comprehensiveness. Moving away from comprehensiveness in global history involves moving away from an idea that any individual is a comprehensive whole, okay? That this is some kind of stable, comprehensive whole. And in my work as a historian of science, I'm trying to move away from stories about objects, things, people, or ideas that circulate, okay? I'm trying to move away from stories about individuals. For all kinds of reasons, um, this is true, and I'll talk a little bit more, and we can talk more about that when I stop talking at you and you start talking at me and we start doing that later. Okay, so is that possible? Is that possible? Um, I think so, I hope so, and I'll ask you if that is possible as I show you um, what I'm trying to do. Now, if it's possible, this kind of project raises some fundamental questions about what we're doing when we do what we do as historians, right? What could archival or documentary work look like if we practiced our craft according to the assumption that historical objects don't pre-exist our encounters with them? What happens if we don't take the existence of objects and knowledge as already given as prior to that encounter? How could this change what it looks like to trace histories of science with a global sense, fragrance, rhythm, right? How could it change that? Now, I've been trying to do this in the context of the project I mentioned earlier on bodies as sites of prepositional experience, right? Inness, onness, throughness, etc. So this is a, a project that tries to pay attention to Manchu texts. This is the first page of this anatomical text up here. Um, pay attention to these texts in a different way in order to motivate new histories from them by transforming them through processes of paying attention into archives of kinds of relationships rather than archives of objects and body parts, okay? So to understand kind of how I'm trying to do that and why someone would want to try to do that, perhaps, let's consider an example. Let's talk about skin, shall we? I like talking about skin, okay? So let's talk about skin in Manchu texts very briefly, and I'll be pretty quick with this. Um, or more specifically, let's talk about what it might look like to bring some of these concerns I mentioned to bear on writing a history of Manchu as an instrument of translation across early modern contexts 
for understanding skin. Okay, so in the early 18th century, here we go with this text, two French Jesuits at the court of the Kangxi Emperor wrote this Manchu language text in which they translated ideas about bodily structures and phenomena common to them or familiar to them from Latin and French texts into a Qing context, and the result was this. This is the Dergici Toktobuha Gatituen Lubitre. Okay, it's a Manchu name that's often just called Manchu anatomy, so that's what I'm going to say. Now, skin is all over this particular text, and I'm going to show you images super duper quickly to show you. Skin is peeled back all over the place. Okay? It's fallen off. It's constantly there, and it's constantly, almost constantly being peeled back, being removed. And we could talk for hours about these illustrations, and people like to. I'm not going to do that today, but we can do it later. So much skin. So much skin. Not much skin. Okay. Um, body covering, though, was explicitly treated in two major sections of the text. On the covering of the head, you see an image from that here, and on the covering of the belly and the abdomen. Okay, so to help us think about what it is to write a history with skin, let's think about skin as an object, okay? Now, when you think about skin as an object, I want you to, and when you think about any object, I want to ask you to think about movement. Think about objects as movement, okay? Okay, imagine with me that all objects don't move, they are made of movement. They are composed of movement, okay? Imagine, for example, we're talking about skin, the skin on the palm of your hand. The skin becomes activated, I will argue, as a thing in the world when it's set into motion and into relationships, when it encounters other things. A breeze blows over it, your eye glances at it, you lick it to taste if it's salty, it is apparently, you use your hand to pick up a cup. You flex it, you plunge it into water, um, and then you dry it off. Whether you're experiencing these events, or reading about them, or writing about them, or imagining them, or watching them after the fact, these are the moments, I would argue, when the skin on your hand becomes an active, storied thing in the world. Okay? Now imagine that the objects or history of history are like the skin on the palm of your hand. They are processes. They are relationships, encounters, aggregates, loci of motion. They are motion. Now imagine we were trying to write a history of that patch of skin on your hand as an active storied thing in the world, right? As a catalyst of encounter between forms of movement, between ways of moving in the world, blowing like a breeze, feeling cold, looking at, looking uh, and being looked upon, tasting, being inside, maybe water, being under a towel. Okay, so as a historian, that might sound great, but like, what's the archive? How do you make an archive of that kind of thing? How do we constitute an archive of documentary traces of these forms of movement, of these ephemeral comings together among them? If we understood this patch of skin to be a process or a collection of processes, not a stable thing at all, and if we understood skin to be constantly motion, okay, to be motion itself, what would an archive of that motion look like? How would we access it? What would a story about that patch of skin look like? What kinds of work would it do? Okay, um, so I want to argue here, and this is where we're going to come toward our final discussion, discussion being one way. One way to create an archive of that motion that produces an object is to look for traces of the motion by looking for moments of coming together and coming apart, like I just described. And one way to do that, I want to argue, and this is what I'm trying to do in a text like this, a text that translates knowledge about bodies from French and Latin contexts into Manchu, is to look for where that motion gets tense or precarious, to look for moments of tension and interruptions in descriptions or explanations of skin. And this is where um, points of encounter, okay? This is what I'm looking for in this text. So briefly put, the discourse on skin in this text repeatedly returns to a common theme, movement and translation across insides and outsides, boundaries and membranes, surfaces and environments. And if we treat this text as an archive of encounters from which skin emerges, we can see a number of places where this comes up, okay? Skin is a mediator of relationships. All right. 
So when I'm looking through this, right, and I'm reading this text, and I'm reading for skin and trying to read beyond skin, what am I looking for? I'm looking for places specifically where, understanding that this is a translation, it seems like the translator or translators are worried that something is not going to translate, okay? Something's not going to come across. And they resort to technologies to try to make something understandable that's not otherwise arguably going to be understandable. All right. So there are lots of references here, um, and I'll take you to um, objects and clothing made of skin, air bladders, blankets, jewelry, garments, fish, deer, antelope products, creaturely skins. Okay. The text discusses specific kinds of skin that cover animal and human bodies and their parts. It discusses ailments that can infect the skin, growths, boils, pustules. If you're interested in decomposition, it's a great thing to read about. It mentions skin-relating actions, flaying, molting, piercing, burning, rubbing, growing. Now, throughout this archive, and here's where we're going to come to kind of the, toward the conclusion here, we can see the relationships that produce and are produced by skin. And skin is consistently about relationships, okay? They're consistently about the um, part of the discourse on body covering. And these are relations between animal and human, normal and abnormal, instrument and goal, among others. So arguably, and if I had another three hours, I would just, like show you lots of details of this, but I'm going to spare you of, of that, and you can read the book eventually if it ever gets written. The archive of skin is an archive of relations and encounters, and those relations become the object of study. Now again, what's most interesting to me is when the, in those relations, there are moments of rupture, interruption, error, some sort of botched encounter or translation. And this signifies, I want to argue, events where different ways of being a changing creature in the world, different kinds of moving, are coming into contact. Now, I want to argue, and this is what I'm trying to do, identifying these ruptures can help us identify and follow these forms of movement, okay, and move away from following the stable object, okay? This is um, from, I just want to mention another comment from the previous date, from this day's discussion, right? We were talking about movement and circulation when talking about one of the papers um, and the comments on the importance of circulation stories in terms of the license to partake and participate, right? Um, comes into play. There's conversation about a moment where the, um, these go-betweens maybe or the figures who are circulating have to justify, okay? Which is a moment of producing a border. Um, I think if you're not justifying, that means it's not an other. This is resonant with what I'm trying to do here, um, and we can talk about that. Um, it's kind of the productive power of anxiety about being an other, and this productive power of an anxiety of a rupture is what's happening here. Okay, when we look carefully at this discourse of Manchu skin, there's lots of moments where something's unclear, where the text seems to reveal concerns with the efficacy of translation, with the reader's understanding of what's being conveyed. Now, these potential ruptures generate a need to translate and explain, okay? And this actually resembles the case of Abdurrahman um, from Rebecca Gould's paper, who was using examples and images to explain um, what I think he took to be potentially unfamiliar concepts, right? Like the train tracks, etc. It's resonant with this. Now, at this moment, um, the discussion often invokes an analogy or a comparative example. Skin produces lots of these, and we see them all over the text. Um, it talks, and I, and I can go on, and I'm not going to, um, but it's uh, the genesis of human skin is explained in terms of animal bodies, right? The molting of snakes is used to describe what happens when skin is warmed and blistered. Human skin is compared with the skin feathers um, and hair of birds and wild animals. Um, the formation of skin is compared to, like when you take a bowl of hot milk and you leave it out in the cold and it hardens, um, and this is what they use to describe that, okay? Um, and other forms of birth growth generation are also used um, to describe skin. The work done by skin is compared to the work done by clothing. Both produce, or both protect the wearer against hot and cold. Skin is described occasionally as a mind or a brain. Okay, the language of cognition and intelligence is used to describe um, how the layers of skin produce sensations. Really cool. Okay? 
Now, in some of these cases, understanding skin is about drawing connections between anatomical and domestic modes of existence, and understanding Manchu skin involves understanding the body as a microcosm of the processes and material cultures of kitchen, household, garden, and field. In other cases, understanding the work skin does to protect, to transmit sensation, is about drawing connections between the labor of the body covering and the labors of other parts of the body. Now, in each case, the text attempts to translate something potentially jarring for the reader in terms of a particular action working, being born, being used, transforming, that would apparently be more familiar. And in these jarring moments, these moments of rupture, these become moments where we can see comings together and comings apart that create skin as a translated storied ephem ephemeral object, I want to argue. OK, so why are we doing this? Remember, um, the reason why we're doing this in the first place, or I'm doing this in the first place, was to try to imagine what a historical practice might be that honored the concerns I was talking about, particularly as they inform the making of global histories of science. Okay? And this example is one way to imagine doing that. Here's why. It offers a very different way of paying attention to this object and to this text in order to make a story that's very much part of a conversation about the history of translated, multi-centered, moving science in a Eurasian context. And this is very much a story of coming together and coming apart, and error, and decomposition, and stuff happening in the margins of what we might usually consider important, or influential, or significant. So we've identified our moments of rupture. What happens next? Right? How do we pay attention to these in a way that transforms the text? Like, what am I talking about practically? Like, show me the money, Carla. I will, all right? How do we make these moments of conversation about skin ultimately become moments of conversation about comings together and comings apart? Identifying the ruptures was the first step. And we might talk about other um, sort of forms of rupture, including euphemisms and mistakes and other sorts of things. Now, here's what I'm trying to do. And this brings me really to the, like, toward the end of this. From here, we might begin compiling records of these moments of rupture insofar as what's actually happening, I submit to you, is that they're moments of creating likeness. Okay? They're moments of creating sameness. They're moments of creating likeness. Being like a fish bladder being like a hot bowl of milk, being like a brain. Then we might compile references to and technologies, grammatical technologies for producing likeness, comparison, sameness, analogy. Now, in, if we do this, we then transform the nature of our archive. Instead of an archive of Manchu skin, we become like we're producing an archive of likeness and the technologies that produce it. And this is a project that I've recently begun, is trying to get rid of, start with skin as a way of getting rid of skin, and instead write a history of processes of comings together and comings apart. And this is one chapter that looks at um, an archive of likeness as a way of talking about the practice of making something like something else, which is, which is a practice that has to be done as a practice for generating experience in the world and generating material, um, sort of materiality specifically. Okay. So rather than understanding the history of skin as an object, we begin to try to understand the technologies that activate skin as a site of encounter. And we can then follow those technologies okay, in other sites, depending on the scale and limits of our study and our time and our funding. Now, once we, once we understand this about skin, in other words, we can treat skin as a momentary concretion in a larger archive of likeness that strays well beyond just these discussions. All right, so the object becomes a tool for identifying movement, forms of movement. And once it does that, it potentially drops out of the story. Okay? Um, and I will, I'll kind of leave it at that. I mean, this is interesting to me and important because this is a way of moving away from stories that are about individual objects. And our previous conversations today about universalism and wholeness. I mean, this is a way of moving away from that, even as it inheres in the scale of a pen, if not a story about world history, right? Like, this, considering this to be a stable individual is also a story about a kind of universalism and a kind of wholeness. And this is a way to try to get away from that. 
So what I'm advocating here is a history um, just as much of coming apart as it is of coming together. It's a history of processes and relationships that stem fundamentally from rupture, from error, from breaking. And this is helpful to me um, as I imagine what it could be like to write a global history from here on out. Now, I share in the call for more histories of the ephemeral and the disintegrating, histories that move away from stories about connection and wholeness and towards stories that grow from rot, stories that rot, right, and ruin and broken things and acts of breaking. Now, perhaps our stories of empires and networks, stories um, that is of objects at massive scales, will increasingly give way to stories of movement, stories of gesture, stories of process, stories of ephemeral objects made of movement that don't persist, but instead resist. Now remember the story of the fish, right? We're coming full circle here. At the end, the student came to know it, right? Came to a point where they could tell a satisfying story about it. Only when the fish broke down. Only when the fish decomposed. Now for me, one moral of that story is that when we pay attention to what we're telling stories about, when we really look, the object comes apart. It's a good thing. It's only then, perhaps, only when the object decomposes that a story becomes possible. Historical practice for me as a historian of science is about dwelling in that, dwelling in the ruins, the rot, the fragments, without trying to put them back together again, okay? But instead, trying to compost within them, to use a Haraway phrase. It's not about giving voice to individuals, to go back to a point about the Anthropocene I mentioned earlier, but to tell a history, to try to tell a history without stable individual objects. So a history of anatomy becomes instead a history of proximal relationships, and a history of skin instead becomes a history of moments where likeness is produced, and so on and so forth. Networks give way to tentacles and to compost. And a global history of science becomes a squiddy organism where we're collectively speaking from the same ground, the same conversation. We're all in this room together, right? But reaching out into very different kinds of stories in different ways, all while acknowledging the ground from which we're collectively decomposing our stories. And that's all I got. So thank you for going there with me. any more honest than anybody else. Um, the, okay, so my, what I first thought I was doing when I got into this global history biz was writing histories of circulating objects. Like, and that's, I think, how I describe my stuff. Right? I'm going to talk about ginseng as it moves from here to there, and it's going to connect people. It's going to be awesome. It's going to be like not about individuals. And I ran into problems with that as I started thinking about what it is I was doing um, for various reasons. One of my sources of discomfort with that as a practice is that if we have stories, not all the time, um, but often, we have stories about something moving, right? Often it's moving from someplace to somewhere else or it's moving in some place. And what winds up happening incidentally to the practice of telling those stories 
even when we're trying very hard not to do that, is it tends to have to reify the stability, either of something that's moving and or the ground where it's moving on. And it goes from China to Europe. Okay, so even in the best, with the best of intentions, and when we're trying very hard not to do this, and when we're producing stories that are awesome, right? There are awesome people producing stories like this who are great. Um, still, it tends, on the long term, to reify a notion that there is a China, right? Something has to stay stable. And it's precisely that work that I'm trying to work against. So for me, in terms of my practice, I found I couldn't do that and still tell stories that I felt were helping me to get at, like to break open individuality. Um, so, and part of, and yeah, and I know there are other questions, I can tell you more, I can tell you much more about that. Well, that's, that also is like more, it's like a technique. It's, a, it's about, I worry that that, even when that's trying to move away from individuality and talk about interconnection, it's reproducing the idea of, and the being of stable, coherent individuals. And that's something I'm trying to not do. And so it doesn't work for me to do that. But, and connections, I'm not actually, um, my stories are actually not so much stories about connections. They're stories about, um, the kind of fundamental way that any stuff, anything, is made of connection and processes of connection and the relationship, that that's what that is, right? And so it's suddenly different. Does that make sense? Um, Cynthia. Um, uh, thank you. Um, I am also a big fan of tension and conflict and separation, but. Um, uh, I have to say, I, 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 I felt a, a tiny little bit skeptical in certain parts of your talk, and so I was um, uh, sort of wondering, um, uh, I appreciate your uh, calling attention to the fact that you know, there's a need to uh, not assume knowledge of, of, um, of objects, either the skin or the state, right, that they have to be um, uh, explored and seen as collections of relationships and connections. Um, that's something I do in my own work. But but I do also think that like possibly I just had a sense at points that you were trying to throw the baby out with the bathwater a little bit and that there's actually just sort of there's a dialectic. I mean the fish mm -hmm. is both a process and a fish, or there's an aspiration to perceive it as a fish as well as a process of change and defamiliarization. And so I'm wondering if like that dialectic isn't extraordinarily important to kind of preserve um, and call attention to. And I'm wondering if kind of the problem in terms of how we approach uh, global history or even just the telling of history today doesn't have so much to do at least only with the nature of what we're trying to observe, but the conventions of the observing and in particular these like boxes that we're kind of um, embedded in and the way the disciplines are kind of constructed around presumptions of, of uh, ordering knowledge um, and that actually what we kind of need today are uh, an acceptance of like what you're doing, more creative approaches to tell stories or an acceptance of telling stories rather than necessarily ordering facts or analyzing data or the stories and data kind of can be mixed. I mean, th 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 that's also an issue to be thought about as well as like the need for um, moving beyond like these conventions of disciplinarity and historical problems. Yeah, so um, thank you so much. So of course, I don't like babies. So the claim that I would throw the baby out is totally consonant with my personality. I'm like, I'm happy to take it. Well, it's going to be productive too. Yeah, I mean, but, but I totally take your point. But, um, maybe not of course, but I feel that the project and the aspiration that I'm presenting is in a way utopian, right? And it's definitely aspirational because of course, practically speaking, what am I doing when I'm looking for the skin and trying to get rid of the skin? I'm looking for the skin, right? And I'm getting rid of the skin. There has to be a dialectic. You're absolutely right. Um, and I think um, the 
this, I mean, this in some ways may be a project that is, in terms of how I'm describing the goal at the outset, doomed to failure from the very beginning. But I feel like it's getting me somewhere much more interesting for me than I would be getting other, um, otherwise. So definitely it's a dialectic, um, and you're totally right about that. And in terms of the process, if I'm looking for something, I mean, this is part of what it is to be a historian, right? You don't just find traces in the archive. Like, there's a process of deciding what constitutes a trace of what you're looking for, and that's an active process, and you have to figure out how to look for something. And so what I'm doing is I'm looking, and in part, I'm delimiting my archive very, very carefully and very closely um, to right now this one text as a way of creating what screams out as a completely artificial and very limited case that I'm using to jump out and make these much larger conclusions deliberately. Um, but yes, part definitely the process involves going back to the object to get rid of it, to go back to it to get rid of it the whole way through. Um, so I totally take the point of what you're saying. The second part is a, um, your second point is a point that's very dear to my heart. I often describe myself, most often now, um, as doing a disciplinary work or transdisciplinary work, um, not interdisciplinary work. Um, and I do think that, um, yeah, I just totally vibe on what you're saying uh, in terms of the second thing. I think train, so students, grad students um, apply to work with me or come to work with me because they get excited about it. Right? And like, so what are my responsibilities as somebody who's going to send students off into the big bad world of academia as it is right now? Like, understand the risks of this, right? On the one hand, it's really important given the job market that we have right now and the current configuration of academia to make yourself into a disciplinary scholar who is legible in those ways. Well, what happens if you're trying really deliberately not to break away from that? And so it becomes really challenging to try to help people do this while still not killing like the little chicken of happiness and saying, you know, like, I don't want to do that. I want to just do that so that I can get my tenure. And I can do what I really want to do. And like that chicken is, is you know, like you need to feed it. Like that chicken could die. Like helping that chicken not die. So it's very much what I try to do uh, as a graduate supervisor. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. You understand. You understand. Yes. Disintegration may be 
historically contingent. In other words, um, you know, what you're talking about may be something that it's important to historicize. So I wondered if you could. What's that? Of course. It, so, so I wondered if you could reflect on on what that um, argument or, or or insight might mean for the way that you approach um, this kind of a project. You know, if, especially if you're reading back, you know, several so numbers. So, what are you, so when you identify the argument or what argument or insight are you talking about? The the, the argument that that um, uh, is particularly identity relations. Yeah. Um, in the present time, okay. have uh, markedly uh, decomposed, right. so that we're an unusually, um, you know, in terms of how people think about themselves in relation to other people, other yeah. things, other entities, um, it's it's unusually fluid, it's unusually liquid, and you know, I wonder whether the fact that this is, you know, if you accept this argument, mm -hmm. I wonder if that affects the way that you use the tools that you're. I mean, I, I hope it's clear that my answer would be absolutely yes. I mean, I, I think one of the points that I was trying to make is that I'm try, I try to be very conscious of the fact that I'm speaking for a particular time in a particular place. Um, and so, yes. Okay. Sure. sure. Yes, of course. Yeah, I, I'm, yes, of course. The, the, the second question is, I wonder if you've thought a little bit about compound pharmacy, um, which is uh, a, a point of intersection for a lot of the... So the I've written, process. actually, yep. written a book on okay. the history of pharmacy, you know, and I've, I've written about area um, and compound drugs and compound that pharmacy. Cool. That wasn't me. Oh. That was... That was okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. That was me, maybe. Um, yes, I've written a paper on Theriac um, and exchange, exchange, you see, I can read that, Chinese and Arabic and Persian texts. Um, part of what I do um, as a long-term project is look at translations between Chinese language and Arabic and Persian language context around natural history and Syrian Africa. So yes, I have thought about compound pharmacy, um, but I feel like there's a particular reason you're asking me that because there's a particular point you want to make. So why don't you make the point about compound pharmacy? How do you think it's relevant and interesting? So, what we're so there's about. a boundary, there's a skin around the identification of the compound. Mm -hmm. And into the into the vessel, um, you know, go things with a number of, of, of particular histories and interpretations and uh, specific forms, which are, in the case of Teria, um, you know, in, in some theoretical interpretations of what it was or what it was supposed to do, um, itself compounded. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, among other things, what it you know, highlights is the fact that this kind of, you know, the, the ontological uh, questions that you're grappling with are primeval, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I guess since, since you've already you've grappled with this, I wonder if you can um, uh, contrast or at least think together with the people who, who imagine the concept of specific form and don't know about the Chinese context as much, but certainly in the classical Greco-Roman context and the kind of decomposition that you imagine. So this is interesting. I'll be super, super brief. Um, as I understand the discourse around the practices around compound drugs in the text that I've worked on that I'm familiar with, crucial to that is often a list of ingredients and a conversation about what, um, how to translate lists of particular ingredients into different local contexts. The compound drug is importantly a product of distinct different ingredients, right? Which are crucial to the identity of that compound drug. And so for me, thinking about a compound drug as importantly in the context at least that I've written about, being composed of a mixture of distinct individual ingredients, um, doesn't do the kind of work that I'm trying to do in thinking with the composition, but I have an act that because of that, I haven't actually thought about them in relation explicitly in terms of what that might bring to how I'm thinking about this process. So thank you, I'll think about that more. But my first sense is that it's actually quite a different phenomenon because of what I just mentioned. But, I can, but I'll think, keep thinking about that, thank you. Not so. 
Since there are since there are kind of various paths of continuity leading to similar uh, recipes, uh, for example, yeah, Albert Speer's kind of theory of ruins as a as a as a code of architecture uh, that, that kind of uh, indexes the, the building's ruin uh, in kind of uh, a vision of the thousand year life, uh, a thousand years into the future. One wants to kind of. Uh, and especially since you're speaking in a particular kind of political moment, mm -hmm. uh, and, and since the, the, uh, the, the, whole, uh, the whole idea is prompted by kind of Edelman's uh, response to, to the challenge of Trump and outright and fascism, mm -hmm. uh, then th there is this kind of shadow of fascism in, in the fetish of ruins that, that one mm -hmm. wants to you know, uh, steer away from and, and, and kind of making a claim for the theory of ruins. So maybe one wants to see it, perhaps. Um, I'm not necessarily one. Um, there are a couple of, I totally take your points, and there are a couple of responses that I have to this. Um, part of a commitment to and an embrace of what I want to call a disciplinary scholarship is a commitment to moving away from what definitely motivated me in the early parts of my career. Um, and what I think motivates a lot of our discourse, which is that in order to authorize yourself to speak on something, you need to first become, have a certain kind of expertise, have a comprehensive command that then authorizes you to voice. And I'm very, very deliberately and very consciously moving away from that um, as part of my practice, um, certainly in contexts like this. And one reason for that is I think, and I really feel this, too much of our lives as academics and as scholars are motivated by fear, um, by fear of not doing things correctly, by fear of not knowing enough, by fear of speaking without knowing everything. That my commitment to being very open and saying, here's what I read, and here's what it makes me think, and here's the text I work on. Here, if you, now you go do something with it, and you tell your stories. And deliberately, and this is constant with what I talked about in terms of moving away from comprehensiveness and universality of the stories that I am telling and the content, is also a commitment to moving away from any kind of semblance of or attempt to reach a comprehensive um, expertise that authorizes speaking about something. So when I speak about this, I'm making absolutely no claim to have read everything that there is um, related to anything that I'm saying. I'm going to open my mouth and speak anyway. And precisely one of the reasons that I love talking to groups like this, so colleagues, is that I learn stuff. Like people recommend that I read stuff, and I go and I do that, and maybe it's inspiring and it changes things, maybe it's not. Um, but I actually don't want to occupy the space that I occupy in the spirit of. I need to steer away from, I need to be afraid of, I need to read everything or know everything there is to know about anything before I can open my mouth because I'm afraid of what happens otherwise. That's not how I work. Um, so I take your point, but it actually, um, I'm still going to talk about your and um, and I'm going to, I will happily look up and read and go explore stuff that you recommend that I explore, but I don't feel a sense of obligation to do that comprehensively before I share thoughts about it. Yeah. 
question there yeah. as the moderator. Um, so how is it, Carla, I mean, I, I've been struggling through Haraway's book mm -hmm. these past few weeks um, and uh, trying to understand what, I mean, it's clear what her political commitments are, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm trying to understand what are the implications, this is now maybe going a little farther afield, but yeah. what are the political implications um, of, I love the idea that expertise is, is, is problematic, and that we need, to, we need to rethink it in, in, a, mm -hmm. in this particular political economy. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's happening now politically. I feel like I hear the I don't know where you're going to go with this, right? The consequences given the post-fact. No, I'm just, I, well, I guess I'm, I'm, I, I, no, we have to, we have to experiment, we have to try, and, um, but, but I just wonder, do you, I mean, what, how do you think of, do you think about political consequences? Yeah. In, in, in these, yeah, or how can we, how can we think about politics yeah. What does politics look like in a disciplinarity? Okay, so just this is my sorry. That's a really big question. No, I mean okay, <laughs> so I can't. I won't claim to answer it, but I'll work in it. Yeah. I'll work with it. Yeah. Maybe. Okay, so for me, just like there's no, I really don't think I'm trying not to work with an idea of stable individuals. Mm -hmm. That's true for cells as well, mm -hmm. and as I'm sure is true for many people, if not all of us. The different contexts in which I speak and engage my work and do my work create different kinds of conversations, and I say different, I present different parts of what I'm working on. We have different kinds of conversations. There are different expectations for what it is to um, be able to lay or state a claim on an hour and a half of somebody's life. Like, why should you listen to me? Different contexts I move in. The answer to that is very different. And so I'm um, very conscious, for example, when I give talks about my work in communities of the story of China, um, I'm very conscious of the significance of the fact that I'm telling a story about empire and colonialism and multilingualism and that has distinct um, resonances right now, and I want it to have those resonances right now. That's one of the reasons I actually started working with Qing. My training was in the mid, in the mid, um, in my first book. When I give talks about uh, readings from my fiction, um, I'm very unconscious now in a way that I never imagined coming up of the fact that I'm giving talks about the um, what can come from playing with and misreading documents and telling stories about you know fictionalizing accounts from documentary traces in a world where we're we're now having conversations about you know like alternative facts, et cetera, et cetera. And people ask me, don't you think you're part of it? I had this really sweet man come up to me after a talk in Toronto and grab my hand and he said, I love what you're doing. Thank you so much. Don't you think you're part of the problem? <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, wow, that was kind of my ending, but, like, but no, you're great. Um, and so I've really been thinking about this and trying to reflect on it. And part of me feels like um, I have a responsibility to actually engage this and raise it as a com topic of conversation now when I'm doing this. Mm -hmm. And part of me feels like I'm not going to be pressured to change fundamentally the nature of what I do and what I work on because there's going to be, you know, like, people are going to worry that, oh no, like, you can't write fiction now or play with um, history because that somehow challenges um, how, you know, the respect for facts and expertise. I'm not going to be pressured to relinquish you know, my sense of what I'm interested in just to do that. And so I, both of those, uh, I'm struggling with both of those at the same time. Um, when I am giving talks, sometimes also uh, talking about and trying to really embody um, a, a disciplinary spirit also has consequences. And what I'm doing there, um, in part, is deliberately trying to be provocative. Um, and deliberately trying also, as much as I can, to be strong and to embody my voice um, and to not back off from that, but still stay open and learn and change, right? Um, so I know you got this is to say, there is no one me presenting my work in a particular way that would offer a comprehensive answer to that question. Um, I can say that question is very much present with me in the different contexts and the ways in which I speak um, and present my work and do my work, and I don't know that there's an answer, but it's something that's on my mind. Yeah. Can you, can you text on that? Yeah. Um, I have, oh, gosh, I'm going to ask that. Oh, okay, how about Dana, since you have a Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm the mediator. Sure. <laughs> Thank you so much for the talk. It, 
really, I mean, I have so many ideas that are irreconcilable that I would love to have dinner with you for four hours over a bottle of wine and <laughs> just kind of talk about each point, but that cannot be done. Yeah. <laughs> that cannot be done. So I'm, I just want to ask you a very traditional question, mm -hmm. and it's about your, your you, okay. which is, when did you see these texts? What did you think about these texts immediately? How did you come to the idea? I want your story. How, how you, when you first saw the text, where did you place it in your, in the way that you had be, learned where to place it? And how did you take it out of there and give us in the end this completed, um, how do you, you know, turn it upside down? Yeah. Finish. Uh, should I answer that? I should answer that. It's up to you. I mean, if you're if you're exhausted, no. Yeah, but if you aren't, then go for it. No, um, oh goodness, how did I come across this text? Um, I think I requested. I read something about some text called the um, and it was a, a, something about the images. I requested a copy of the, um, the manuscript from Vienna. I looked at it, and when I first looked at it, um, what I saw was, let's see, how do I tell a story about this? So the gene, like asking me a genealogical for an account of this is difficult. Um, okay, I'm going to keep it super brief. When I started working on Manchu documents um, about materia medica and bodies, what I was trying to do initially is write a history of science and medicine in early modern China, specifically as it um, pertains to natural objects. That was going to be a multilingual history. And I have this whole book set, right? There's going to be a chapter on Tibetan stuff, and there's going to be a chapter on the Holy stuff, and there's going to be a chapter on Manchu stuff. It's going to be great, got funded, excellent. Once I sat down to actually think through it, um, realized that it was a completely wrong headed idea. It didn't make any sense. And I was amazed that nobody was like a fun, like a, a cut, but it was like, what do you tell, like how do you separate these distinct language groups as if they're distinct kinds of knowledge that completely undermines the work that I'm trying to do here? That's not gonna work. Alright, well what if I focus, right? I really focus on a context where translation is key to what's going on. I'm gonna look at Manchu stuff. Start studying Manchu, teach Manchu now. And I started looking at these documents and these documents were initially, this is the stories that are written about them. They are pro Jesuit products of a very particular engagement with the Kangxi Emperor at the court. They did not circulate. They were not accessible. They are not important. Mm -hmm. We cannot tell stories about them beyond a certain point because we do not have the kind of social, cultural, historical apparatus to fit them into the stories, and so why are they important? Um, and I got tired of having to answer that question. Um, and so what I decided to do is just read them anyway and see what I saw. And I started getting really, really interested in um, the way that words, like Manchu terms for um, like, Manchu terms for a roundabout came up. And then so, and so I started to, I wasn't interested in scan. I was interested in that sort of stuff, and I picked it you know, arbitrarily um, as like an object to look at. And so a lot of a lot of it's arbitrary. It's like there's no reason skin and not bones or blood or whatever. It's just like yeah. and um, let me just intervene. I know there's a lot of interest here. I, I believe that we are supposed to make our way into the dinner, dinner. and there's wine there. So, oh, what it means so. is, <laughs> I, I, I'm sorry that I can't extend the invitation to everyone, obviously, for the participants. But, um, so I'm going to, I hope that we can continue these really um, wonderful conversations. Any of you who wants to continue the conversation, yes. also email me. Email me, be in touch, um, and we can also, you know, I, what's going what's gonna to happen is, I'm going to see the email. It may be one of like 500 emails that comes in, and so I may be like, "This is an email I really want to thoughtfully respond to," and so I will get to it. Email me again.